Hali Do, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native culture, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And I hope you'll do me a favor. Feel free to like and share these episodes. I so appreciate it. Yakuki. Hey, y'all, check out my new t-shirt. This is the Native Chalk Talk Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Chutta t-shirt. I've also got sweatshirts, cups, all kinds of things, and a portion of proceeds goes to support the cause. Simply go to cafepress.com forward slash Native Chalk Talk shop, and we really appreciate all your support, and please pray for the families and the victims. Yakoki. A Choctaw woman sat gazing out her nursing home window, soaking in the warmth of the sun that was making its way through the mimosa trees. Through her aging eyes, she glanced down at her brown and feeble fingers and hands as she crocheted yet more doilies. Perhaps these would be for the arms of her chair. These once young and strong hands had made baby blankets, hankies, clothing, and moccasins. They helped tend to her family's farm. They drove a team of horses hitched to a wagon. They held her beautiful baby boy. They clung to the United States flag as her veteran husband was laid into the earth. Her eyes saw grocery stores replacing her family's vegetable stand. She saw the wagons being replaced by cars, and she watched as her baby boy grew into a war hero the papers singing his praises, something that had never happened to anyone in her native community. These hands and these eyes had experienced pivotal moments in history, and yet here she sat in this nursing home, the last home in which she would ever live. Did anyone care to hear this history and these precious memories? She guessed they surely wouldn't be interesting to anyone. Little did she know these stories were interesting and someone out there would certainly care to hear them, but only after she was gone. I hear all too often, why didn't I ask more questions of my family members when they were still with us? Now their history and memories and stories are gone forever. I too am one of those with deep regrets. I should have asked and I should have listened more. But it's not too late for some of you listeners out there. You may have family members still living who would be willing to sit down with you and share their memories. You may have to twist their arms a bit, but trust me, the effort will be worth it. Set up the recorder or take video on your phone or write it all down or whatever you have to do. But please do try to capture these stories. My guest today is one such person who took time to do so, and I'm so grateful that he did, because today he is going to share with us the beautiful stories of his ancestors. Stanford, welcome to Native Chalk Talk, and thank you for taking time to share with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'll start off by bragging on you just a bit. Stanford is originally from Cayenta Black Mesa on the Navajo Reservation. He received his engineering degree from Northern Arizona University and has worked in the architecture, engineering, and construction field for the last 20 years. His experience includes projects for indigenous tribes, professional architects and engineers, general contractors, government officials, and private owners. Stanford has received multiple awards and honors, such as the AIS. SES Sequoia Fellow, issued by the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, where he also holds a lifetime professional membership. The 2018 Governor's James W. Garrison Heritage Award, issued by the Arizona Preservation Foundation and the State Historic Preservation Office. In addition, in 2012, he received the 40 Under 40 Award from the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development, recognizing Native American citizens for outstanding leadership and community contributions annually. Stanford was also a team member for honorees for the restoration work on the historic Navajo Nation Council building in Window Rock, Arizona. Stanford, way to make your nation proud in the field of engineering and beyond. Why don't you tell us about your world growing up on the Navajo Reservation? All right. Uh, thank you, Rachel, again. Uh, my name is Stanford Lake. Uh, in the Navajo culture, the most important thing you start off with is uh, our 
our kinship of of what clan we represent in our communities and also on the Navajo Nation. So let me introduce myself. Yate She Stanford Lake and Chia. Tlisafan Shlon Putitini Bashishin Kia Ani Dashiche Tohane Dashinada Totinesje De Isinasha Dodjitin Dodd Nasha. But I did mention Dai Behadesh Dito Dai the Dinenshle Do Preska Arizon E. C. Ado Shapando Nashnish Ad Kihe. Um, I just introduced myself in my Navajo, um, the Nepizad, which means Navajo language. And, and it's important to express my introduction as my clanship. You, uh, as a Navajo, you usually have like a, four clans that you present yourself uh, to the elders, especially so that you know, they know who you represent and also where your community is located at. So that's how I uh, Introduce myself. Uh, and I mentioned uh, the Dene means uh, the people in the Navajo language. Uh, it for Anglo language, it's called Navajo. I, like uh, like I mentioned, I grew up in Kienta, Arizona, and on weekends I would spend my time with my siblings and my parents up on Black Mesa, Arizona, which is located probably thirty minutes south of Kienta, Arizona. So, and again, Kienta, Arizona really was just uh, growing up near the school system, public school system uh, of the Kienta Unified School District. So I went to school from there when I was in kindergarten through uh, 12th grade in high school. So and when I turned 18, um, I always dreamed about going to college as a first generation, uh, both my parents um, both did go to college, but they never um, completed to get their degree, but they always encouraged me and my siblings to uh, go to school or go to trade school, whatever, so that we can uh, be able to function in today's society. So thank you. Wow, that it sounds like they really instilled in you to not only take the torch that they started, but to continue on forward and and into completion. And I'm really excited about the things that you've done. I mean, engineering is not an easy field. So you went all in, you took their advice and <laughs> did not slow down and you kept on going and you're still going. You must be proud. So it sounds like you also lived a pretty traditional way of life. Tell us about that. Um, the traditional way of life um starts with the i guess uh m more of just an instill of everyday life on the navajo reservation meaning um uh, planting corn and attending to our corn fields during the starting from the spring and then through harvest harvest season which is the fall season season so we did it pretty much every single year we would do that with uh, both my parents and also my grandparents um, and a lot of teaching was um, a lot of teaching was presented during that time uh, after a long day in the cornfield we would probably get <laughs> one of the um, watermelons or just have a barbecue to just to celebrate the hard work in the in the hot summer. And in that time, either my grandparents or my dad or mom would tell stories to us about um, how they grew up uh, during, when they were younger. Or, and then my grandparents would talk about how they also uh, worked in the cornfields and how that was taught to them from their parents and grandparents. And so it, it's a it's actually a tradition and a lot of if in a lot of uh there's a lot of ties of our tradition um like the cornfield i mentioned uh, it's also in, instilled inside of our sacred songs and just uh, as a traditional person gr um growing up in the navajo uh, 
religion. We uh, went to a lot of summer ceremonies and also the winter ceremonies. And some of it's called Da, which meant the enemy way. And also during the winter, there's the Yebichi. Uh, we call it the Hajon life to be in balance with uh, nature and also be in balance with a lot of different um, elements that we, as we go through life and stuff like that. So when we go out of balance, that's when we would seek a local medicine man or medicine woman that will keep put us back into harmony, we call it. We cleanse ourselves, or soul, or mind, and just a lot of things so that we were back in balance. There's a lot of teaching through the, the cornfield, like the harvesting. I was just going to say, it's it's interesting that the harvesting is one of the most important things that you brought up right away, and the corn, and all of that. And it goes back, it sounds like generations and generations of the way that you're doing corn. Is it just internal for your people to eat the corn, or is it is it sold outside of the tribe? Um, actually, it's more of, uh, besides the corn, there's also like watermelons, squash, and beans, and just uh, potatoes. Those are what I meant by the cornfield, those different type of uh, oh, vegetables okay. and yeah. things that were that that are harvested or planted and harvested and stuff like that. So it, it, those are really important things that our ans or my ancestors were able to use that when there was no grocery stores and right. things like that, um, that they would depend on not only that, but also hunting and stuff like that, games, um, like um, wild turkeys. I think the most important thing also in the culture is uh, sheep. Sheep is sort of a traditional um, food, and, and there's a lot of things associated with sheep. Um, mm -hmm. And they also... Um, and you take care of your sheep and takes care of you back through um, uh, food that we eat from that. So, so yeah. if you, with, with us Navajos, we have uh, really enjoyed having our mutton food in the traditional way through the stew or, or dried meat. We also bring in like the steam corn that's been harvested from the cornfield. Wonderful. I mean, it sounds pretty healthy living off the land yeah. out there. Can you think of ways that, say, the corn, for instance, is grown today from the generations of the perfection from your people over the years? Is it different than the way maybe a typical farmer would farm their corn? When I grew up, uh, we had access to um, tractors. So my dad did have a tractor and we were able to use that to harvest. Uh, before that, my grandparents would say they, they didn't have that luxury of that. They would use mm. a, a mule or, or a horse and pull like a plow, like a single plow and use that to, uh, to, to plant corn and yeah. the different yeah. things. And they mentioned the generations before before then, their grandparents beyond, they didn't have that those tools. So they would probably use a branch off of a tree and use that to um, uh, hold in the ground and plant the seeds and stuff like that. And, and all these, and also the another important thing about the cornfield is uh, the seeds, uh, those are passed on from generation to generation. So they're kept in storage. So for the next season, stuff like that. Amazing. I wonder how far back that goes. Um, yeah, that's uh, interesting. I, I have read a few things about some traditional farmers, not only the Navajos, but the Hopis, um, that the, the, the seed is sort of a generation thing that hmm. is important. So, As you know, Native Chalk Talk is all about preservation, capturing our Native stories and history and culture. And as mentioned, when we're younger, though, we don't think to ask our elders questions about their own stories and lives. However, you had some interesting talks with your mother and your grandmother, correct? The stories that was instilled in me was more of maybe in the winter time when when we're 
eating at a dinner table, they would always bring up uh, in the old time, they would always talk about the old time, about how they grew <laughs> up, or or even um, um, stories like the coyote, coyote stories, which has uh -huh. a lot of, he's, he's considered the trickster in the Navajo um, culture. So, but in the story, it so instills like good, information of not mm -hmm. what to do and what there's a meaning behind each of these stories and stuff like that the Navajo culture that a lot of it's passed through um just storytelling and yeah it's not like it wasn't recorded or anything and it was just this passed on from generation to generation and it's just something that now with technologies we're able to capture a lot of this before it's 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 gone stuff like that I know in the Navajo culture, there's a lot of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're in, we, we're in balance with a lot of different uh, elements. Um, yeah. And yeah. to keep in balance, there's also taboos in the Navajo culture that if you do something bad, sort of come back and, and a medicine man or, or else you have your own family do prayers over you to help you hmm. get back in balance and stuff like that. So, Well, and speaking of medicine men or medicine women, you have one in your family and we're going to talk about her later, which I think is fascinating. And I do wonder sometimes how the stories change over the centuries. <laughs> like, you know, how, how far off have they gotten like a telephone game? But that's even part of the mystique and and the coolness about it as well don't you think yeah that's correct um, <laughs> so in those talks you also learned about an ancestor that was a code talker so you you have to tell us about this this is so fascinating yeah uh it, I, I think um when, when growing up again in the early 80s when i was younger my dad would always have these stories about his uh, his maternal uncle, with, uh, which means my maternal grandmother's younger brother. His name was Carlos Begay. Uh, he was the only um, male in the family of sisters. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> so he grew up in, in uh, among the Bitterwater clan, which was his clan also. And he was originally run from Black Mesa area. Arizona also and the way that my dad talked about because he he was one of the close members to him when he came back from World War II um, he mentioned that uh, when he, he when he was 16 uh, he wanted to go to a place where he never has been been before uh, all he did was herd sheep most of his life and he told his grandfather that take me to um, Fort Wingate, uh, New Mexico. Hmm. And he was only 16 at the time. So his, uh, his great grandfather took him to Fort Wingate by wagon. Uh, back in the day, they had wagons with mule. And that was their, that was their transportation uh, to go from Black Mesa to Fort Wingate, New Mexico. It probably takes like two to three days on with wow. the wagon and stuff like that. So, so when he got there, uh, he pretended that he was 18, and that was the only way that he would be able to volunteer in the U.S. Marine Corps. So he, uh, his grandfather, with him witnessing that he signed and decided to volunteer and, and enlist in the U.S. Marine. Um, because at the time they were recruiting, they were in need of the Nav Navajo male World War II was going on, and it was one of the ways to, to besides to volunteer, but also have a job. Uh, mm. So that was one reason why he volunteered. And he volunteered probably somewhere in the early 1940s, um, based on my dad's record for recollection of what he was told to him. And so from Fort Wingate, um, he was transferred to uh, Camp Pellington in California and he was he went through a special uh, I guess he went through boot camp first and then afterwards he was told that he was going to go under a special um, program um, project called the 
I guess uh, at the time maybe it was called Navajo Code Talker, Code Talking School. Mm -hmm. And some of the words that he remembers, my dad remembers, uh, it was like um, bird, uh, city, which means airplane. Or, oh. or another word would be like city viaggi, which means bird's eggs, which means bomb. Oh. I guess this one right? really is. Another one would be like shush, which means bear in the Navajo language, means, which means there's an attack coming. So, so words like that, he remembers being told to him. Um, and then he would share that stories about uh, that to us when we were younger. Uh, and this is the early 1980s when he was telling me and my siblings, but it, it, right. there's right. a time when the Navajo Code Talker was still unknown. Just mm -hmm. maybe just to the family members of all these uh, Navajo code talkers that would, they uh, shared stories like that. So, um, and then he, from Camp Clinton, when he went through the Navajo code talker school, um, he, he completed that. And then he went with the, maybe they call it platoon or division across to the Pacific, across the Pacific Ocean to to an island called Iowa Jima. So in that Iowa Jima, I guess he, he was uh, also in the same um, group as Ira Hayes or Gila River Indian community member that was famous for raising the flag on Iowa Jima. So one of the things that my dad shared was that uh, him being in the same group as Ira Hayes, uh, there was that right before the flag um, was being raised, uh, I guess in that small group, they needed some volunteers uh, to go up to this mountain and, and present this flag up on this mountain and stuff like that. And, there, and he said uh, there was no one wanting, wanting to volunteer and everyone was really afraid because there was a lot of ammunitions and things right. that was that they I never meant. thought about that. So uh, a lot of the men's were scared and stuff like that. But, um, and even my, um, I guess you call it grandpa, or Carlos Begay was afraid and stuff like that. But I guess um, all of a sudden his, his good friend, Ira Hayes said, I'll, I'll volunteer, even though he was afraid to go out there to, the, to this mountain. So he did his um, duty to raise his flag with uh, I guess oh, I four other people and then raised his flag up and and be, became famous and stuff like that. So and and I guess uh, he he mentioned that after the war when he came home there was really no welcome. Um, ceremonies or or things like that because it was just a special project that was and they were told to keep it a secret and no one knew and no one knew and wow it was, it was a declassified until years later um, i think maybe in the 60s or 70s i can't recall but sometime during that and but i think uh he, he my dad said he was a, a good uncle but also a lot of mental health problems after mm. the war wow. and he did a lot of heavy drinking coming uh, when he got home and stuff like that but and he, he I guess he never recovered from that and just um, passed on back in the, in the 1970s so so fascinating is there anything else you can think of about that time frame or your family members in the I guess in World War II era our own elders Navos a lot of them were started working for the like areas like uh, Belmont where they were making uh, ammunitions and bombs right to help support the support the wars and stuff like that. so a lot of them were recruited in that direction and then a lot of them also were uh, recruited to work in the uranium mines mm. up because uh, you know that the there's the U.S. discovered that uranium was used can be used as a nuclear weapon, and mm. and I believe that's one of the things that helped stop the war was 
was dropping two nuclear bombs in like, Japan. So, hmm. so would that happen? Or some of our Navajo people were also working in the uranium mines to help support the wars and stuff like that. Interesting. So I, I know that there's been a lot of controversy over the years and and I think that there should be no judgment either way with how people feel about it. But some people are like, well, our native people shouldn't have fought for this country. And yet I know so many veterans, native veterans who are extremely proud to have fought for this country. But it sounds like there are some Navajo that believe in fighting for our country. Oh, yeah, it's definitely true. Um, the They're considered warriors in our culture and they're really... Uh, when I go to different uh, ceremonies, both in the traditional way and also the Native American church, and they're always the one that are told to rise and get blessed and because they're honorary, considered uh, defending our you know, song, which means Mother Earth, a lot of honor and just a lot of things that just to help us protect us from our freedom, I guess you can call it so. Thank you, veterans. How do you say thank you in Navajo? Uh, ahehe. Ahehe. Veterans. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apologies to all Navajo. <laughs> Tell me about your parents, Alice and Joe, right? Yeah. Well, my mother, her name is Alice Cly, her maiden name. Um, uh, she grew up in northwest of Kienta area, up in the canyons. Went to um, the boarding school in Kienta, Arizona, and then in high school, she went to the Phoenix Indian uh, school up in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So she, she told me that um, that she worked odd jobs while going to high school because uh, there wasn't enough money coming from home, so she had to sort of support herself through to high school ah, by ah. working at maybe a sewing machine shop or some downtown Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So that's how she went through um, high, um, high school. And then from high school, um, she went back to Kienta. She got hired as a boarding school um, aide, uh, I guess you call it, dorm aide uh, at the local uh, Kienta uh, BIA boarding school. So okay, she, okay. she did that for... Um, 40 plus years and uh, maybe like six years ago, she retired from there and you now she's doing that. And, and then my father, he grew up in um, Black Mesa area. Um, also in the traditional way of like herding sheep and, and just hmm. doing the normal as a traditional. And he went to different, we call it boarding school. And he mentioned he went to uh, Chin Li and and he told me a story one time when he first uh, went to Chin Li, him and a group of relatives from Black Mesa uh, decided one night to run away from the boarding school and went back maybe took him maybe 50 miles to get back from Chin Li to Black Mesa area so just because it, he thought that he wanted to come home and stuff like that yeah so was it because yeah. of a bad experience you think or he was just homesick or both uh maybe just homesick and stuff like that um just yeah. maybe not used to the to the new education system at the time and this would be probably in the 1960s that he was, yeah so. hmm. you know it's interesting that there's a, a space in time where you know, our, our ancestors had to go from a certain way of living to changing that way of living. And so there's a two generations that, you know, let's say a grandma and grandpa and their, their grandkids or however the far the generation gap is where it's like, well, we used to live in huts or teepees or grass huts or whatever the case is. And now you're living in wooden or brick homes or, you know, things like that, where we didn't really go to school. We tended to the sheep. And now my kids are going to an actual school and they're learning certain things. They're learning math. And it had to have been such a, a strange disconnect between those different generations 
especially grandparents. I feel like with the Navajo, though, it feels like they held on, you all held on to your traditions and culture a lot stronger than maybe some other tribes were able to do. Do you agree with that? Um, I agree in the sense that kept our tradition alive and our, our Dene language, but I know since maybe the turn of the century, 2000, it's has been where technology has grown and yeah, where right. <laughs> we're we're now living in a time where our our use our Navajo use are accustomed to these technologies and and have little knowledge about our previous traditional life that that I was brought up in all my my parents were brought up in so but I think also technology can be also be good, meaning it could help preserve some of these cultures, help yeah, right. teach yeah. the domain language using apps and different things or through YouTube or someone can archive a lot of these uh, our native language to it so that it's not lost or something. You know? Much so. agreed. Much agreed. Obviously, that's why I have a podcast and I, I'm i seeing more and more elders kind of agreeing and, and being open to that. I can see why it's a scary thought, but I'm hoping that it just keeps things alive and going and all that. We'll be back after this quick break. Are you looking for the perfect gift for your significant other, your bestie, or even yourself? You know you're worth it. Luxury soaps, lotions, and lip balms from Baker's Bar Soapery are 100% Choctaw crafted, and they make the perfect gifts. This work of art is their signature turquoise soap, and it's made to look like Sleeping Beauty turquoise. Do you see this gold veining throughout? And the gold marbling on top? Love it. Next, check out this Apple Mint custom fragrance oil soap called Say Their Name. And all proceeds go to the missing murdered indigenous women Choctaw cause. You'll only find this blend made specifically for this soap. And yes, these are made with goat's milk, which leaves your skin feeling soft and supple. So load up on these Choctaw soaps made by Tiffany at Baker's Bar Soapery at thebbsoapery.com. But be sure to get 20% off when you use the code NATIVECHOCTALK, that's all caps, when you spend $25 or more. Treat yourself to the luxury your skin deserves with Baker's Bar Soapery. Now, your parents, they married in a real traditional way, correct? Uh, that's correct. What does that uh, look like, a Navajo marriage? Yeah. So I the, the traditional way of, I guess that you can say from my parents' uh, generation and beyond before that was, uh, they call it arranged ma marriage, meaning mm. the... The groom, and the, when he's considered up as an adult and enough to take care of himself, um, then the parents or the grandparents of that of his family would go um, in the distance and find another family that's not related in plans, um, and ask if they have a young woman that would be a possible bride to to this groom and stuff like that so they would request that there's one and so in my parents situation my dad's um, parents went into the Kienta area and asked um, some families in the area if they had a bride for their son and, and they came across my grandparents home <laughs> in Narrow Canyon and decided to create this uh, arrangement of marriage. Um, and, and had they so, met them before? Uh, they never met before. Wow. So they only, I guess they met on the day of their wedding. So No <laughs> way. <laughs> so that's the traditional way of, of many generations ago. That's how they, that they were. Uh, it sounds they, like it worked. They're still. Uh, it, it worked. I mean, in. in but so in in the tradition when they okay the arranged marriage, then the groom with the family would supply um, like 
um, sheep, horses, or cows, and also now jewelries, um, right. slash belt, which is considered wealth by the Navajo culture, and they would present that to to the to the bride's family as a as a gift. What about the cases? I've always wondered in these arranged marriages where they give gifts and that kind of thing, or dowries, however you want to call it. How what do they do in the cases when maybe they don't have a lot and they they don't have goats to give or whatever the case? Um. Well, I, I believe back in the day, um, there there was a lot more um, wealth of sheep and, and yeah. things like that yeah. that these every family had on their now they made it work it, it worked and stuff but now that um, the land is dry and um, i mean not I'm not saying that the Navajo arranged marriage still happens not i don't know if it still happens but it, because of the reduction in livestock and right you know, right. now um a lot of the traditional Navajo weddings are now where it's this exchange of money um, and okay. besides okay. jewelries now besides if that family doesn't own livestock or something like that. So, I mean, so your parents were going through that arranged marriage and prior to that, you know, that's how people got married. But after that, so it sounds like what from what you're saying today, even if it's jewelry today or money because there's not sheep, sounds like people are still getting married in that way in the Navajo culture, correct? Um, that's correct. Uh, it's just based on um, each family. I mean, I mean, okay. now families um, may have both the traditional way and also the in their other religion would be the church and stuff, church way. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Which is only the church and stuff. Like that, so. Yeah. Uh, so. And there might be different clans, maybe that practice different methods. Like maybe uh, yeah. some are more. I don't want to use the word primitive, but more traditional. Um, yeah, like yeah, each clans, each region of the Navajo Nation has different uh their own custom ways of, of doing these traditional ceremonies, like okay. tra traditional weddings and stuff like that. So it's just up to to the bride's family the way they want to um and do the wedding ceremony. It's just yeah. So. I love that that's still going on. And again, I feel like it's kind of a rarity these days. Uh, yeah, uh, but I know that I'm sure that arranged marriage is in the past. Uh, it's not something that now you have our younger generations that now meet um, I don't know, at colleges or. or yeah, <laughs> they're bringing home the person they want to marry. <laughs> correct. That's correct. So when uh, after marriage takes place, where do the bride and groom go or where did they go? Did they stay with the parents the of the bride or the parents of the groom? I mean, because again, it, they could be two different clans or. or... Yeah, there are two different there okay. are two different clans, but uh, usually the custom is the, the groom uh, would stay with the bride's family because um, he's now uh, considered a family member a male figure in that family so mm -hmm. he's, he's, he, he has a lot of uh, responsibilities now uh, to the family yeah uh, and whatever he was taught he would bring to that family like I said maybe he worked in the cornfield or he raised livestock or sheep herd so he's able to do some of those duties and stuff like that. yeah bring some value to the family Correct. and all that and um, so I know that you've sent me a photo of one of your relatives. I can't remember if it's your dad or grandpa standing in front of a clay looking home. Can you describe what their dwellings tended to look like and maybe even look like today? Okay. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the, the traditional Hogan, we call it. Mm, Hogan. Yes. Hogan. Um, okay. So it's an eight sided um, structure, the traditional structure back maybe from the early 1900s to the, and before that they use um the local um wood materials around and they built the this hut 
covered the, with dirt clay and stuff like that. And mm. they kept that way they kept it's, it was well insulated and, and um, the coal never got in. And during the summer, they would wet the floors and that would help cool the inside area all day and stuff like that. Yes. So, <laughs> so it's really, to me, I always considered uh, that they knew about green building, that this was a traditional uh, dwelling hut that the family would use year round and stuff like that too, too as mm -hmm. a place that they brought up their families and mm -hmm. had the traditional ceremonies inside of it and things like that well in that case they probably were not nomadic correct um they weren't nomadic meaning before right. the before the 1900s though before the navigation i guess 1930s before the tribal government came into play a lot of our, uh, a lot of the Navajos can use the season in the wherever the wild animal, uh, wild games were at. They would move around from different areas to different areas and makes sense. Also, yeah. the sheep had. There's always the winter camp and the summer camps um, where the these different locations that they they use and stuff. So. The traditional hogan was uh, was more of a place for ceremonies and stuff like that, and so these different oh okay uh, have those would come to really and, and do their ceremonies, but most of the times they would they would be in uh, cha oh, which means uh, traditionally a shade house, hmm. so they would uh, use that as a way of moving around different regions because of. The sheep might be grazing at certain places or what the water holes might be certain places. Right. When you were talking about making sure that the floors were watered to keep it cool in there, I was thinking about Waylon Thompson, who is, um, he's one of my uh, guests, previous guests. And I did a sweat at his house with his family and some other people. And one of the ladies that was there said that she would do sweats with the Navajo. I think she's part Navajo, but in Arizona, in the summer. And I was like, that must be so hard. And I realized as someone who doesn't do a lot of sweats that, that, that seems impossible to me, but to someone who does it all the time, I'm sure it's not that big of a deal, but it has to get really hot out there in the summer, much less with the sweats. Right. Uh, and that's correct. So again, the Hogan really, it was a ins really tightly insulated um, structure really had huge thermal yeah. mass so a lot of uh the weather never uh, never got cold or hot during the summer inside the, this traditional dwelling amazing like so i think one thing you touched about too sweat so they we have this uh miniature type hogan dwelling that our traditional people use they call it the sweat house chop uh, and this structures uh, where they would build a fire and then put the hot uh, stones inside this um, hut and stuff like that and then they would sweat it was mainly to pur to purify themselves to mm. have to be in the hajon way a good balance again so another way to balance yourself to, through the sweat and stuff like that mm. so, wonderful i mean a a, a lot oh, yeah it, and I forgot it. The meaning behind that that uh, structure is called hache. Hache. Correct. Okay. Yeah, a lot of folks don't know a lot about sweat lodges. They may hear about it. Um, I know that a lot of people that are non-native have picked it up over the years, so it's become this kind of commercialized scenario for some people trying to find spirituality. But to our Native American people, it is kind of part of the fabric of their lives you know especially those that such as yourself i assume who has grown up very traditional so thanks for sharing a bit about that as well so what can you tell us about your dad's side your dad's mother um my dad's mother her name in the Navajo language is called Saint lake meaning um the lady lake i guess you call it that's how she, her name is uh, spelled on on envelopes and, and 
mail or just things right that, <laughs> yes. so anyways uh so she had a young maybe a younger sister a twin sister and her name was at, at lake girl lake so she was huh. the lady lake and then her twin sister was the girl lake so younger Aww. so there but she, her i guess her twin sister passed away in maybe about four or five years ago but Aww. so but anyways uh she actually grew up in the traditional way of the navajo also um did a lot of um doing cornfields also like i mentioned and also tending to um her sheep a lot the sheep was really it was like another um relative to her like it was important to her to be around her ah, sheep all the time. Interesting. so she heard sheep all her life oh. until she re maybe reached 80 years old are you serious and, or, yep the worst she wasn't she wasn't able to see anymore that's one thing that mm. which she wasn't able to do so and then her health was sort of failing but she, um, but mainly it was her eyesight oh um, so and then I guess she started to lose a little bit of her memory and the family decided to put her in a nursing home in Chinle, Arizona. Uh, she's probably, she's going to be about 104 years old this month. So she's. Oh my gosh. Life. Yeah. Dan, so, that's amazing. Yeah. Someone who's 104 years old has so much of a lifetime of seeing things change over the years. I mean, what's her yeah. story? What, what was she like? Do you, I mean, do you know uh, much about her history? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, one thing she had was that she was constantly just working all the time. <laughs> she was no always... wonder she's lived so long because she's <laughs> probably healthy. She, yeah, she she cooked a lot of the traditional food. She knew a lot of these traditional food that not a lot of the Navas know or no longer use, but she was able to use the corn in these different ways of um, wow. of using the corn husk a way to wrap them and put it in in sort of like a covered ground fireplace and to do these traditional food and oh so ways good that, uh, it's really um not, like i said not a lot of the, um people still do it like another thing would be like the corn mush um or the red berry mush, which is mm. just different, really different things that she she did that I remember. So, please tell me someone has captured her, I guess, so called recipes. Yeah, I, I don't know if anyone captured that, but I knew I, I just remember Oof. memories about this good food that I used to eat from her, from her wow. kitchen. Um, so, she was born around she, 1919 ish uh 1920 uh based on records that i i saw okay. on ancestors.com yeah and, and just amazing and just did a lot of other stuff like that but mainly just uh i saw her cooking a lot for guests that came to her home family members and, and just really hard-working lady that just when she's around other people she sort of been like a shy person but <laughs> to the immediate family she's a really strong person that wow. everyone saw so it was like, you don't mess with your grandma that's <laughs> right no you right. don't no no <laughs> sir so, so does she did she speak english or no she, she never went to school and all she knows is um the, the nepizod Napa language so well, everything Beautiful. around her. one thing i told my kids was uh to see the outside world uh, go beyond what i had gone through and your mom went through but so the way i always interpret it is that my this my, the grandma this naughty lady i had the only thing she ever she's around is maybe within the 10 mile radius or or maybe maybe twenty mile radius. That's all she saw. I mean, that's all she's. That's amazing. And herding sheep and stuff. Like that. 
And then the next generation, which is my parents, they probably only within the 250 mile radius, like uh, into the border towns is sometimes they go into the, those areas, but that's, and then they come home and, and, and take care of their livestock and stuff. And then myself and my wife's generation were beyond yeah. that. I'm right. Six hours away from where I grew up in Black Mesa. So it's mm. sort of like larger radius, a 500 radius. Um, I like to travel to you and but I tell my kids travel beyond the United States, see other so cultures. True. So, so true. That's how I always interpret it. So when I bring up that, I always think about my my right. grandmother that's only able to see so much. But I think in in her time, she's able to see the changes from the from the, ki- the grandkids and my mm-hmm. parents of, of what but she's she never was able to go beyond that but she's just able mm-hmm. to it's kind of neat though isn't it to think that someone has lived in that kind of a bubble all their lives that's all they know and they don't even speak an outside language do your kids speak Navajo as well uh no they don't speak Navajo but they do understand a few words uh, a few words that yeah. I sometimes exchange conversation with my wife so I sort of able to pick up some certain things well I think it was really mainly be, um, because uh, we're away from their their Navajo nation exactly Navajo reservation so right they're not around it every day like you were growing up and and your wife and everything just but, think of how their generation to your generation, you know, you were you first language Navajo speaker? Uh, yes, my lang- first language is Navajo. And that's rare, too, for someone of your age. And so and, and again, that brings me back to the whole Navajo kind of preservation of your culture and your language and all that beyond what I see in a lot of other tribes. But how interesting that their grandmother doesn't speak English. You're bilingual, at least bilingual, maybe trilingual, I don't know. And then they only speak English. And that's how fast something can change culture and language wise. Interesting. So the Navajo language to me, there's a lot of chish sounds and and kind of like the keeping your teeth together um, formations in the mouth. Um, I'm very interested in the the different tribal languages and all that. To me, it sounds so far from, say, just a few states over, like you, my Choctaw people in Mississippi seems very different in the sound. Do you know much about the background of the language? I know a little bit about the background. Um, well, I guess in the traditional way of our culture, our religion, our ceremonies, the Navajo language was given to us from the holy people within mm-hmm. our language. Um, we consider it we're in the fourth world, so it's been, that's the way the teaching has it. But it, I guess if, if you go into the, say, ancestor.com or other ways that you're researching about this language. Um, right. It's actually a, a language that there's also, they call it sister tribes that speak similar language, but their their dialogue is different or, or right. Right. Different, it's sort of like the Apache, uh, White Mountain Apaches. Um, I've been invited to some events there in the past and, and to sit there with the elders or in the people there eat, i can pick up a few things what they're saying and they're it's amazing it's, really it's, it's similar dialogue but um i think i believe that it's sort of like a family branch i believe i, I can't remember the name the term but it's yeah. a language that's that goes up into the northern california area and up into the king uh, canada and to the alaska region where some of these uh sister companies have similar dialogues but has changed maybe over time so that's just amazing to me because it does it makes you wonder i mean a, a person who has studied the languages would know better than i but it makes you think okay what if at one time there were only there was one people and then for a long time there were only say three tribes and then there were hundreds and hundreds from there and so that's why there's so many similarities among some of our different tribal languages so fascinating yeah. So, but I I know that 
like I mentioned, the the Apache tribes uh, were have similar um, dialogues. But if I went into the Hopi Nation or the Zuni Nation or any of the Pueblos or even the South Indian tribes down in Phoenix, the Tucson area, they're they totally speak different. A different Are language. you serious? So there's That's crazy. Uh, it's <laughs> and, and just different, really different. So just have to, I guess, spend time with them to be able to understand. Oh yeah. Things. But but it's just, well, I mean, all tribes has their own language, and also even the Navajos uh, of the Arizona side, the Western Navajos, and also the Eastern Navajos. Some of them had different dialogues meaning there's some some words are expressed differently than between the two locations and stuff like that so that's so maybe, interesting maybe they're mainly maybe they were influenced by yeah other yeah. tribes or, or or the spaniards at the time right the early 1900s yeah so true and then so when you do speak to someone with an eastern dialect for instance just making that up um can you understand what they're saying for the most part? You're just missing certain words. Um, I I can understand about eighty to ninety percent of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's some words that are differently said differently. Um, I know one word is coffee, uh, and I know in the Western we call it hue. I mm -hmm. believe over there it's called gohue. Uh, I believe that's Go how. It Gokwe and then in hmm. the western is called Akwe or different region is just different. That's so. that's just so interesting. Yeah. When you heard Coach James Nels, who I think he was in season two of Native Chalk Talk, when you heard him speaking in in his language, did you understand what he was saying? Uh yeah, I understand uh, pretty much all of his talks because I, I like okay. I was, so really you guys must be around from kind of the same area. No, uh, he. In his talks, he said he grew up in the Delcon region, which was the south southwestern of the Navajo Nation, okay. which is actually, actually also where my my wife grew up in the same area. Ah, so. Okay. Yeah. I so. know this is a stupid question, but I wonder if they knew each other. <laughs> I I don't know. Uh, sounds like uh, Coach Nils when he went to college and he came back, he moved straight straight to riverside uh, yeah indian school so he's oh, okay only came home when there's ceremonies and stuff like that so i gotcha um you know he he talked about too so i kind of wanted to ask ask you about this um how there would be people all sleeping in their home and he could hear people talking you know, telling stories at night or just talking at night and then he'd fall asleep. It was kind of a comfort feeling. How many people could fit in one of those homes? And then do, do you remember, you know, memories like that as well? The way my parents uh, brought us up, we were able to live, uh, me and my siblings, uh, the younger sister and two younger brothers, I'm the oldest. And then my parents, we always lived in a, in a home in Kent, Arizona also. And a traditional hogan on Black Mesa. So we're able to be situated where it, we weren't living together with other relatives because I think both my parents were able to work and just kept So it was just your immediate family, yeah. basically. So the yeah. way that Coach James mentioned Niels um, is some some of our people also have generation of family members from the grandparents down to the their kids and grandkids that live in the same home um just because it's both affordable in a way the only way that they're able to to make a home and stuff like that uh, especially on, yeah. The, on yeah. the reservation that's the way it is absolutely I, I i know through my work uh, engineering work and working with the different um, departments on the Navajo Nation. The, uh, the main thing that's hard to get on the reservation is called um, home site lease, which is a 100-year ah, ah. lease given a one-acre 
where you're given from the Navajo Nation. And once you're granted that, you're able to build your home or move a, a home onto that property. So, oh, so it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's, a, it's really complicated to get that lease. So what happens hmm. that most of the time is that grandparents might be able to invite grandkids or the family members to live with them because it's, it's yeah not that does sound complicated and unlike what i had thought i hope you enjoyed this episode stay tuned for part two coming up thanks for listening to native chalk talk be sure to join our community on youtube facebook instagram and twitter and check us out at nativechalktalk.com stay tuned for the next episode you're gonna love it yako ki thank you my friends <laughs>